Hello and welcome to today's lesson on Hertzsprung Russell diagrams, which is part of the astrophysics or a topic in AQA A level physics. So, in today's lesson, we're going to try and understand Hertzsprung Russell diagrams. So, if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to know the general shape of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, determine the part of the stellar life cycle from the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, and determine the axis and the scale of a Hertzsprung Russell diagram. Now, in 1911, it was realised that if we plotted the spectral class against the absolute magnitude of stars, then the stars could collate into distinct areas areas. So a Hertzsprung Russell di diagram is essentially a plot of the luminosities of stars against their surface temperature and a great deal of information about the products of the stars can be obtained from it. So this is a scatter graph of the luminosity of a star compared compare to the sun against its surface temperature, which is worked out by the Vine Displacement Law and the Stefan Law. Now both scales are log logarithmic and it was developed independently by two separate astronomers, Hertzsprung and Russell. Now they developed the graph independently of each other in the years 1911 to 1913 and they're given joint credit in graphs of this type are called Hertzsprung russell diagrams in their honour. So as the surface temperature in the, her in the star is closely related to the spectral class, we could either place the surface temperature or the spectral class on the x-axis of a Hertzsprung russell diagram, whilst the y-axis is a measure of the brightness of a star, its absolute magnitude. Now in our, in our uh, scale we have very bright at the the top and very dim at the bottom. Now what we know from absolute magnitude tells us that very bright is a very negative value whilst uh, very dim is a very positive value So, because we've got to remember the magnitude scale system. Now you've got to be able to recall the maximum and minimum values of this plot for a standard hertzmann russell diagram. Now a standard hertzmann russell diagram goes from plus 15 at the dimmest to minus 10 at the most brightest. Now the x-axis is a measure of the surface temperature of the star. Once again we have very hot at the left hand side and we have very cool at the right hand side. So we tend to find that it's 50,000 Kelvin at the left hand side whilst there's 2,500 Kelvin at the right hand side. Now you have to be able to recall these values for your examination. Now just to note this scale is non-linear and just to clarify we've got very hot on the left hand side of our Hertzsprung russell diagram and very cold on the right hand side. So our temperature goes to the left hand side of the diagram so it increases the further left you go. So the temperature is scaled in the opposite direction to what you expect from most other graphs in science. Now this scale, whilst it is non-linear, can also be represented with a spectral class with O on the left hand side and M on the right hand side. So this leads to the graph in the following areas. In the top left hand corner of your Hertzsprung Russell diagram, you get bright and hot stars. In the bottom left hand corner of your Hertzsprung Russell diagram, we get hot and dim stars. In the top right hand corner, we get the bright and cool stars and we get the dim and cool, star cool stars in the bottom right hand corner. So we can play the observed stars on this diagram and we get the following areas. So just to clarify, we'll be, we'll be separating out our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram into the different spectral classes, or you can consider it in the different temperatures. Now you'll notice that the stars on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram are not randomly scattered. They are divided into three principal groupings, as you can see here. So placing the stars on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram scale leads to the following groups. Now it can be approximated that all of these stars have a, a roughly the same power output but we've got the red giants at the top right hand corner the main sequence in the band in the middle and the white dwarfs in the bottom left hand corner now let us consider the main sequence first now you've got to be able to place two stars in the main sequence the first one is our own sun which has an absolute magnitude of plus five and a surface temperature of 5700 kelvin so it's in the g type air spectral class and you've also got to consider Vega, which is formed, which forms the basis of our magnitude system in astronomy. So the absolute magnitude of Vega is approximately plus five, and it has a surface temperature of 10,000 Kelvin, so it's in the A spectral class. Now, main sequence stars are, are in their long-lived phase where they're fusing hydrogen into helium. Now, our sun is currently on its main sequence. Now, approximately 90% of observable stars in our universe are currently on the main sequence. Now, at the 
top of the main sequence are the hot and luminous blue stars, and at the bottom are the cool and dim reddish stars. Now you've also got the red and the red giant and red supergiant group. Now this region suggests that the stars are bright, but they're quite cool. Now you've got to be able to recognize one star from this region, which is Betelgeuse. Now Betelgeuse again has an absolute magnitude of approximately plus uh, minus five, and then has a temperature of 3,700 Kelvin. So as a result, belongs in that part of your hertzsprung russell diagram. Now we know that um, P equals sigma AT to the four. So the red color suggests a low temperature. So to maintain the power output, the area of these particular stars must be large. So this tells us that Stefan's law can be used to explain why some stars are referred to as giants or some stars are referred to as dwarfs. So for example, a dim star with an absolute magnitude of plus 10 in spectral class B must have a, must be much smaller than the much brighter star absolute magnitude minus 10 in the same spectral class. So it allows you to work out the sizes of our different uh, stars. Now, because we know that P equals sigma AT to the 4, we know that these stars must be giant because the low temperature indicates that to maintain the power output, the area must be large. Now, the red giants are the stars which have moved off the main sequence and the fusion reactions other than hydrogen to helium are happening inside of them. Now, supergiants have massives as masses typically 10 to 100 times that of the sun and are therefore substantially larger and much more luminous than even the red giants. Now supergiants are hot enough for nuclear fusion reactions to produce carbon and the heavier elements. Now the final group we need to focus on are the white dwarfs. Now this region suggests that the stars here are hot but dim. Now we know that P equals sigma AT to the 4, so the white colour suggests a high temperature, so to maintain the power output, the area of our star must be quite small. So the white colour is very important because it indicates that these stars must be dwarfs and have a small air surface area to them. Now white dwarfs are stars at the end of their lives where all the fusion reactions have stopped and they are slowly cooling down. Now white dwarfs will eventually cool to the point of emitting no heat or no light or no radiation and become black dwarfs which appears to be the end state of all low mass stars. Now the significance of the hertzsprung russell diagram is that it tells us that they exist that there fundamentally are different kinds of stars. So when astronomers first saw these groups they were puzzled. Why were there three distinct types of stars? Well it was later realized that the stars were at different stages of their life cycle. So it allowed astronomers to work out that there was a stellar life cycle. Now from the hertzsprung russell diagram we can see different stages of stellar evolution how stars are born how they grow old and how they eventually die so this is the stellar life cycle for an average size star step one the star appear starts on the main sequence now the placement of the star on the sequence depends on its size now as the star carries out fusion it moves along on the main sequence ever so slightly now the star do, will not move up the entire main sequence it won't go from the bottom right to the top left, it might shift a small amount on that main sequence diagonal band, but it won't move across all of it. Then the star will become a red giant and move across to our red giant section here. Now again, the placement of the star on the sequence is dependent on its size. And then finally in step four, the star becomes a white dwarf. And again, the placement of the star on the sequence depends on its size. So you can see here our different stages uh, of our stellar evolution for an average size star. So you can see here a bit, a bit more clearly the evolution of a star like the Sun on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Now just to clarify, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram we cover in AQA A-level physics is a slight um, simplification so you can see a more thorough uh, version of the hertzsprung russell diagram and this in fact is a lovely image it's a collated hertzsprung russell diagram of all of the stars observed with the visible with visible telescopes in human history and you can see our nice regions in our hertzsprung russell diagram have formed as following now what you should be able to do is as follows for the hertzsprung russell diagram you should be able to state the general shape the main sequence the dwarfs and the giants have axis scales ranging from minus 10 to plus 15 in the absolute magnitude and 
50,000 Kelvin to 2,500 Kelvin if, this, if it's the temperature, or OBAFGKM if it's a spectral class. Now, you should be familiar with the position of the Sun on the hertzsprung russell diagram, and you should, have this, you should be able to show the path of a star similar to our Sun on the hertzsprung russell diagram from formation to white dwarf. So if you've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, you should be able to state the general shape of the hertzsprung russell diagram, determine the part of the stellar life cycle from the hertzsprung russell diagram, and then finally determine the axis and scale of the hertzsprung russell diagram. Thank you very much for watching today's lesson on the hertzsprung russell diagram, which is part of the astrophysics topic in AQAA level physics. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a lovely day.